Okay. So again, sorry for the uh, te technical issues here. So, uh, so again, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank you all for joining our webinar today. Uh, before we start, I would like to introduce myself. I am Dr. Itab Shoaib, a doctor and a specialist in inclusive design. I am a researcher and academic in the field of um, inclusive in the field of architecture, human-centered approach, inclusive design, accessibility, and disability studies. I am currently leading the Disability Hub Center for Lebanese Studies at the Lebanese American University. And I am one of, of the uh, fifth steering committee members at the Disability Hub. At the Disability Hub, we conduct research and studies about disability in Lebanon and the region to learn more about disability rights movement, the barriers and gaps that limit the full inclusion of people with disabilities. We adopt the social and the human rights models of disability, and we advocate for the full inclusion by producing short videos and, uh, 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 and awareness campaigns that co uh, consider the needs of diverse users with and without disabilities, family, children, the elderly, and the people with different and diverse backgrounds. Today, our webinar is entitled The Global Perspectives on Sign Language Interpreting, the Role, Education, and Professionalization of Arabic and International Sign Interpreters in Lebanon and Jordan. Our three panelists will be talking about their experiences and perspectives about the sign language they use in the countries they live in and their vision about mainstreaming sign language. I would like first to introduce Ms. Kate McAuliffe, our moderator today. Kate is an uh, American sign language interpreter and a PhD researcher. Our first speaker and panelist today is Dr. Hussein Ismail from Lebanon. He is the founder director for the Learning Center for the Deaf and the founder president of the Lebanese Federation of the Deaf. Our second speaker, and the panelist is Mr. Olive Pulio from the United States of America, now living in France. Uh, he founded Overseas Interpreting, which provides interpreting services all over the world. And he is also an interpreter himself and works internationally, particularly as an interpreter between international sign and uh, English. Our third panelist and speaker is uh, Mr. Saif Saleh from Jordan. He is a Jordanian sign language interpreter who interprets Arabic and uh, Jordanian la sign language. Now I will pass the talk to Ms. Kate who will be moderating this session and she will give us information about the features that we will be used uh, in the session so the webinar is accessible for all our, of our attendees. Welcome, Kate. Thank you. Thank you for that welcome. I'm so glad that you got reconnected and we could hear and see you very well. Um, before I get into the fun content of what we'll talk about, just do some description to make sure that we all keep connected. Um, hopefully you could see our sign language interpreters going. Um, the whole webinar is going to be conducted in spoken English but we're very fortunate to have an Arabic sign language interpreter. And if you would like to view that interpretation, you can pin Naila. And we also have some international sign interpreters with us today. So if you would like to view that interpretation, you can pin Helsa and Rob, and they'll be switching back and forth and they'll let you know when it's time to switch and pin the other interpreter. We also have our live captions going. So if you can't see the captions yet, uh, press the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It should be all the way to the right. It has two C's and a little box. If you press that, um, you should be able to see the live captioning, the live transcript going. Um, it is not being done by a human being, it's being done by a computer. So if there are mistakes, um, hopefully you can still understand. And if there's any confusion, just pop a question in the chat box and we'll clarify for you. Um, in terms of visuals, we're not going to have any slides or any video today. Um, so the only visuals are 
the lovely faces of our panelists and organizers and interpreters. Um, and any of the written material, like any of the questions that come up in the question box, I'll read out loud. Um, what else? If you have any need for accessibility help, if things are confusing or you can't hear or see what you would like to be hearing and seeing, send a direct message to Misa in the chat box and she'll talk you through how to pin or if you're having any technical issues. Um, at any time throughout the webinar, if you'd like us to maybe slow down a bit or repeat something um, or anything's not clear, just put a question in the chat box either directly to Misa for accessibility help or just in the public channel. Chances are, if you didn't understand something, somebody else probably didn't either. So don't be shy at any time ask some questions. Um, we'll also do Q&A later. So put those questions in the question box as well. Um, feel free to keep them in the public chat. If you are feeling a bit shy or you'd rather be anonymous, feel free to send your questions directly to me. Um, I will be reading them all out loud and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, in general, if you could, everyone except the panelist who's currently making their remarks and the interpreters are we're all going to turn off our cameras and mute our microphones just to preserve our precious bandwidth and make sure everything keeps going smoothly. So now that that technical stuff is out of the way, um, I'll give a little introduction to the background on this webinar why we're all giving up our precious hour and a half. Um, thank you, by the way, for coming. Um, yeah, this webinar came to be because, well, I'm a very fortunate person and I have one foot in the interpreting world. I work as an interpreter and then I have the other foot in the research world and I get to collaborate with Dr. Itab and Misa and the Disability Hub. And I think it's almost a year ago now that Dr. Hussein was describing to Itab and I about how in Lebanon, the lack of interpreting services is you know, it's enough and it's time to uh, develop some services and some education and training and how the Learning Center for the Deaf has this goal and, you know, thinking about where to start. And I thought, well, I'm an interpreter, maybe I can, you know, I'm happy to lend, you know, any advice, but I'm just one person from one background. So it'd be great to bring in some other minds, some other experiences, but why, have this conversation behind closed doors. Maybe it would have been more practical and maybe it wouldn't have taken us almost a year <laughs> to just have some coffee chats over Zoom. But, you know, what's that quote? It's like knowledge is the only thing that increases if it's given away or something. Anyway, so we thought we'd have people come in and uh, be flies on the wall for this conversation. Uh, it's really just to share information and experience about how interpreters are trained and um, how standards are kept high, how they're certified, how they're provided, and what role they play in the deaf community in these different contexts. Um, it's important to note that while we might talk about best practices and things that are going well in some places, we're not trying to dictate to anyone, or in this case, to Lebanon about how they should develop their interpreting services. It's just to, you know, why start a foundation from absolutely nothing when you can start a foundation from um, the wealth of knowledge that's already out there. So that's what we're doing. Um, so we'll have this chat. I'm going to pass over to Dr. Hussein to tell us about the context in Lebanon. And then we're gonna have Oliver tell us about what that looks like on a more global scale. Then we'll go back to the Middle East and we'll have Saif tell us about what's going on in Jordan. And then I am going to maybe come back and talk to you because I just can't help myself and do some follow up questions. And then finally, we're going to turn it over to you, our lovely participants, because, well, I kind of lied. You don't get to be flies on the wall. We actually need you to give us your comments and your questions and your ideas, because that is gonna help us even more um, to have a deeper conversation and maybe think of things that haven't come up yet. So please submit your questions, your comments, your ideas. And that's it. Um, oh, one accessibility thing I did forget 
is that we're going to have a transcript in English and a transcript in Arabic uh, available after this webinar. And this is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. Um, so if there's anything that you aren't comfortable having recorded or um, you like to stay more anonymous, feel free to change your name, your display name, um, send any messages directly to me or Misa, and um, let us know if you have any concerns about anything. And finally, I'm going to sit back and listen to this wonderful conversation. So Dr. Hussein, we turn it over to you to tell us about interpreting in Lebanon. Thanks. Um, hello. Um, first of all, uh, shall I start it now? Can anybody see me? Yes, uh, wonderful. First of all, I would like to thank um, uh, Dr. Idab and Kate and also Lebanese American University for making this uh, webinar possible. It's wonderful that uh, we will uh, share about the situation of the interpreter in Lebanon for all people to understand what's going on. But before going into detail, I would like to share some uh, background information about the situation of the of Lebanon. Um, I don't see myself on the video. I just see Kate. Is it possible to put it up uh, my video on the screen? Um, we can Kate. see you. I can see you. Kate. But I think um, maybe if my son makes you a, make sure that you're a co-host and yes. then see. That's fine. That's fine. Um, also, if you um, in your screen, if you go up and see the blue, like three dots at the top, you can select um, self view and then you'll be able to see yourself. But the most important uh, that anybody can see me clearly because of being you know, the internet uh, problem, but it's clear for the sign and speak at the same time, it's clear. Uh, excuse so me, uh, the, the view for all the speakers, for all the, for all the attendees is the gallery view and they can, they can follow the host's view, which is, uh, which is now five, five screens are available. I'll send the tab screenshot and I will show her and she can share it with you. Yeah. But uh, I can see you, Dr. Hussein, you look very clear and uh, yes, understanding you very well. Okay, again, again, I want to thank you so much. Uh, as you all know the, about the situation of deaf people in Lebanon, uh, their human rights, their rights are missing. Um, it's not being provided, of which most, you know, among all the important rights that are not addressed are both access to information and access to communication. For access of information, you know that in all public and private sectors, information should be accessible to the deaf. Likewise, equally to hearing peers. What are the means uh, for accessibility in the, in the area of access to information? These are first captioning. You know, you have a captioning on television, was also captioning on internet and so forth for deaf people to understand what's going on. Also, uh, easy, easy to read document. A lot of deaf people are not competent in, you know, in language. Therefore, we need to provide it. And this is not an issue today to elaborate it. And especially a sign language interpreter for, for the deaf. These are um, things for access to information. And for the area of the access to communication, the professional accessible sign language interpretation is very important. Before uh, discussing the subject of interpretation, which is our main topic today, I would like to give an idea about our goals, spreading and promoting uh, sign language in Lebanon, not only in the depth and the level of the deaf people themselves and their family members, but also in society at large. Um, there are some points I'd like to share. First, uh, even if a deaf child is in, in a regular school, 
we believe that uh, this, ch this deaf child is entitled to have a sign language learning at different educational level, to have a contact also with the deaf community. We also encourage families of deaf, uh, uh, of deaf children, especially those who are deaf children are comfortable using sign language as a means of communication so that the parents learn how to use sign language at the same time to preserve the identity of the deaf child. We also have uh, started teaching sign language courses at, on the way back to 2004 to the public as well as to the families of deaf children at the same time, we also give these courses at the Learning Center for the Deaf, also at the educational university settings. We do a lot of uh, campaign uh, on awareness about sign language and the deaf community on different uh, settings. We also facilitate access to interpreters. You know, the, in Lebanon, we don't have interpreters, but there uh, are needs of the deaf people, they need interpreters, we provide interpreters, mostly by uh, those interpreters of the CODA, children of deaf adults. Like uh, they have a good experience in signing, but also we do the guidance so that they know how to communicate or providing interpretation for deaf people in different settings. We, we encourage, at the same time, the use of sign language in public uh, media, especially on social media, uh, as well as captioning. We are still persistently trying to make the breakthrough for the vision of sign language interpretation. There was once upon a time that the Lebanese army have liked the idea that I like to adopt it, but unfortunately it was not yet uh, applied. We tried with the Lebanese government, with the politicians, with the stakeholders, and it didn't work. And we also add, as being the member of the World Federation of the Deaf, WFD, they have written a letter to the Lebanese government that we have been trying to kind of lobby to provide the sign language interpreting for Lebanon. At the same time, uh, so too, we have the challenges, but we are so grateful to uh, Disability, Disability Hub, who were the first to adopt a sustainable approach for accessibility that respect the needs of the deaf, that they have made a video to be posted on the internet that always they, they provide sign language for deaf people to understand what's going on. It's wonderful, great job, uh, Disability Hub. We are also working on a project to spread sign language in specific sectors, depending on the readiness, for example, banks, nursery, vendors, and so forth. Sign language development, which we have already started at the university many, many years ago, and we hope to continue working on it in terms of publication, book, research, and so forth. And finally, we, have, we plan interpretation uh, program, mainly to meet the needs of the deaf. Having said all this background, uh, we'd like to talk about the situation of Lebanon in general. In Lebanon, interpreters are not provided by the government. The Learning Center for the Deaf intermediate with the interpreters who are paid but with a fair price so that the CODA would be encouraged uh, with the people to pay and they go on with the responding the need to go on. And uh, about our goal in order to fulfill our dream, we have a goal. Um, to, to make it uh, sign language service uh, interpretation program be possible, available, we have to have plan. Uh, many years ago, when we are being the member of the World Federation of the Deaf, I met in one of the conference with the president of the World Association of the Sign Language Interpreter, president. So we have discussed about this uh, issue 
situation problems of Lebanon, she was so kind. She made a kind of connection between uh, ourselves and with other countries who have had experience in establishing service uh, service program. They have provided the uh, program and uh, curriculum. So I have seen all the program, which is a high level. So we tried uh, to apply this by developing a special curriculum that is being for Lebanese sign language, but there are regulation laws in Lebanon that we need to follow. First, uh, to establish a college or whatever, higher, higher education for interpreter service program, you must have kind of a rule to follow, like you have to have an independent campus, you have to have parking facility, space, swim pool, and so, so, so. We cannot afford that, we cannot provide it. We have a learning center, but it is an excellent location. Therefore, we, they suggested us to establish a technical school program leading to certification. That is a three-year program. We accepted with an idea that uh, after three years training program, the Lebanese Federation of the Deaf, which we were working, collaborated, working with learning center for whoever can follow, can work up to see how they are doing interpreting or for the deaf in Lebanon underground, which is good. At the same time, uh, we have, you know, dream to work on the development of Lebanese sign language. In Lebanon, we have six ways of signing. We dream not to work on unification, but to work on, you know, development of Lebanese sign language, but leading to or interpreted to learn one language instead of six dialectual languages. About the uh, having all this, the impact of this dream, of this suggestion is great on that community. First, it provides a wonderful kind of a feeling of independence for the deaf, because they are used to depending on, you know, siblings, parents, friends, bringing over to the adopter, whatever, for interpreter. But it's not good to have it professional, sustainable interpreter, making deaf people be feeling independent and also preserving their dignity, self-confident and productivity. They are more productive when they have professional interpreters coming with them. And also uh, interpreters can help the deaf community to expand their culture, knowledge, what's happening around the world. If they have been isolated without interpreter, they are left out. Interpreter can help them to understand what's going on around them and what's going on in the country. That is very important. That gives an equal access to information and communication, whether in the public sector, privately, or, or education setting. Having all said, the learning center for the deaf provides sign language courses, but these courses are not enough that they were ever learning to become interpreters. It's not enough. Therefore, we, uh, together with the Lebanese Federation of the Deaf, we have a dream, a dream that we wanted very much to be establishing a interpreting training program and also to have a kind of a follow up and to make the sure that the program is effective. Thank you. One more, one more last thing is to our experience, uh, just to in Lebanon, uh, little simple things. If you want to attain simple things, it takes many, many, many years to be achieved. But sometimes the right door can be open for such a project. So we hope for the sign language uh, interpreting service program that the right door would be open to provide it there the lead of their rights for information and for, for communication, inshallah. Thank you so much for that background and what a perfect note to end on as we pass over to Oliver to um, tell us a bit about what this looks like internationally uh, in comparison with what you just shared with us. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Hi, everyone. First of all, thank you for um, the invitation. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hussein, for uh, opening up the uh, this conversation. Um, so honestly, uh, in stating the reality of uh, of your own situation. So I believe I was invited to possibly provide a wider perspective um, and perhaps um, point to some of those doors that could be opened um, by looking outside of your local context. Um, can everyone hear me all right? No? Does this work better? Yes? I think that sounds better. We just needed you a little bit louder. Sure, okay. I think that's okay. All right. Um, do you want me to start over? Um, yeah, why not? Start over. Sure, okay. Uh, for, first of all, thank you very much, um, Kate, and for everyone who's organized uh, this, uh, this webinar for in inviting me uh, this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you and uh, thanks to Dr. Hussein for uh, opening up the conversation um, in, in such an honest way. I believe that I was invited here to um, provide a wider perspective in terms of uh, interpreter development, um, both I and what I, how I will put it is both structural and, uh, and personal. And so I guess I will dive uh, right in. And uh, again, as Kate says, please feel free to, um, I guess, interrupt me. I'll keep an eye on the, the chat if anybody has questions uh, while I am uh, delivering this. So listening to uh, Dr. Hussein uh, made me realize that uh, Lebanon is in fact um, in a very similar situation to many countries and is in a very similar situation in terms of the, the pathway or progression that many countries take to achieving the goals that they want to achieve. Namely, um, having a solid interpreter base a solid sign language interpreter provision that satisfies the members of the signing community so that they don't feel like they have any barriers just because they choose to use sign language every day. Now, while that sounds good, even in the most developed countries where there are thousands of sign language interpreters, Deaf people still don't feel that way a lot of the time. It depends. It depends on where you live. It depends on what kind of services that you can access. So just to say that there is no perfect ending, that I, or at least one that I think we have seen uh, yet around the world. There are countries that are in better situations than others, of course, um, and so I'll try to take you on uh, a little bit of a journey in terms of what what those steps might might mean to arrive to a better place, right? So first of all, you I believe that this cannot really be done privately, right? So the you, the governments need to take responsibility for their citizens, right? And they need to take responsibility for their citizens who, for whatever reason, are in a more vulnerable position than the majority. Um, and signers being minority language users uh, ca are often categorized uh, like this. So then the next question becomes, how do we get support from the government? How do we get the government to agree to basically a budget for sign language interpreter training, for um, f paying sign language interpreters and for, for the work they do. And it might not be 100% funding from, from the government, but for certain situations, for example, in the UK, the government will pay for sign language interpreters who are uh, 
working in employment settings. So if you have a deaf person who has a job and they need an interpreter to, um, to do their job, the government will pay that interpreter so that the employer of, that, of, of the deaf person doesn't have an additional burden of having to pay for an interpreter on top of paying for their employee. So it kind of levels the playing field. So that's one example of, uh, of government support. Um, and that's, I think that's a best practice example um, that they use in the UK. Um, and the way that we know this is because a lot of deaf people from outside of the United Kingdom move to the United Kingdom just because they know they're going to get that support and they can't have they, they and that support doesn't exist in their um, in their home countries right so how then do we convince the government that you know this needs to happen this is important for their community well we you you said that you've already connected with uh, with WFD and had them write a letter to the government, which is a very good step forward because then you know we have an uh, an organization, international organization, which is kind of paying attention to what you're doing, but also but that's kind of that's from the outside. That's somebody from the outside knocking on their door, and the government might say like, okay, well, who cares what the WFD thinks of us? we have a lot of other priorities going on right now, right? Which is most likely the case. Um, so then we think about how we can pressure governments from the inside. And uh, the example that Dr. Hussein gave of the disability hub um, providing basically uh, best practice examples of whatever project they're doing, they're making sure that there's that there's sign language involved, and in some ways, uh, if if you're clever enough about it, you can do, you can make the government feel kind of like they're behind. Because if the private market is doing it for their communication and they want to reach out to people with disabilities, people who use sign language, and the government has very important information regarding COVID or regarding any other kind of um, national matter, and they don't provide this information in sign language, it's a little bit of like, and, and you bring this to their attention, you say like, well, how come it's like this and like this, we only get this amount of information, then they can feel pressured to um, try to do something. Um, and that pressure uh, can come from um, the, you know, your association, the association of the deaf for sure. But one thing that I feel that might be missing uh, in the, this picture, uh, at least in Lebanon, is a, in, a sign language interpreter association. I'm not sure 100% if you have a sign language interpreter association in Lebanon, but if you don't, then I would, th I would think that that would be um, a, a good step forward. And of course, all of these associations, most of them, uh, are run by volunteers. So it's it can start with three people. It can start with five people, but who really believe that people, uh, sign language interpreters who are working um, in Lebanon, and maybe you later on would have uh, an extension, right? So uh, of, of um, Middle Eastern states uh, that are that that create their own regional sign language interpreter um, association. So the sign language interpreter association with the deaf association can pressure the government um, in several uh, in several ways. One of those ways is by working with uh, academics like Dr. Hussein to um, to show the government, um, you know, research about, you know, w you know, basically show them the statistics, show them the numbers, show them the education numbers, the employment numbers, all of which are presumably way below bar compared to um, others in society. Um, the disability hub and probably the um, national disability organization there um, has been pressuring the government to ratify the UNCRPD. Okay, and this is a very, this is also a very important step. It doesn't mean that things are going to happen tomorrow, but um, it 
it is uh, for Lebanon. I looked it up, and Lebanon has signed the UNCRPD, but hasn't ratified it yet. Um, and so, as soon as they ratify it, then you can show the government and say you ratified the the Convention on People with Disabilities, which under Article Nine um, states that there is a um, that professional interpreters, right? Um, and should be provided to people who are deaf or people who sign. So uh, that, that is something that you can use and say, you signed this document, now you have to start doing this and we're happy to work together with you to do it, right? So that was just um, a little bit about structurally how to maybe move forward. But in the end, I guess my, my main message is that um, you're going to have to liaise with the government and have to pressure the government and, and demand meetings with them to, um, to show them that this is a real problem in society that can't really be ignored. Um, and I will just quickly uh, move on to the, I guess, the personal part or the personnel part of it, which is... Who are interpreters? Where are the interpreters? And how do you find interpreters? Even if they are untrained interpreters, how do you how do you attract? Even if you set up a beautiful interpreting training program, how are you going to attract people to become interpreters? Right? And I believe that there's kind of a wrong way and a right way. Now, the wrong way would be to advertise yourself as more or less a helping uh, profession because as interpreters, um, sign language or spoken language interpreters, we are basically working between languages, right? So it's, 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 a, it's much more of a, it's, it's a, it's a cognitively demanding field. Uh, yes, you're working with people, but in no way do I consider my job uh, helping others, right? It's, it, it's, it's, you know, there are many languages that I don't know. And so if I rely on uh, subtitles when I'm watching a movie and I don't understand them, I don't say, oh, thank you, subtitles. You helped me so much because I'm so, you know, um, whatever, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I'm so lacking. It's just like, no, not everyone can know every language and that's why you have interpreters and translation and subtitles and all these other things. Um, so I, I think that's, I, maybe it's an open-ended question um, in terms of how to do it right, um, but attracting people, uh, A, who have some kind of connection with sign language already. So traditionally that means people who may have uh, deaf people in their family and they just naturally grow up signing. And so, and I'm one of those um, people. And uh, now I think we're called heritage signers, uh, but there's a lot of other names, uh, CODA or what, however you want to label it. Um, but because one of the issues in all countries, I believe, um, save maybe one or two, is that there's not enough interpreters. So you have interpreters with PhDs, you have interpreters, you have great interpreter training programs, you have all everything set up, you have government paying like great money, but you still don't have enough interpreters. So I think from the start, there should be a kind of message about where are, where are we gonna find these future professionals? How do we invite them into um, our communities um, and and that, that's something that has to be done between the interpreter association or interpreter representatives, at least, and the deaf association, instead of thinking of us all as, you know, okay, you're the hearing who can sign and can interpret for me, and we're the deaf who have, a, you know, a totally different um, life, and we need you to, you know, so that we can, we can do what we want to do in terms of work or, or whatever else. Um, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that just to hopefully open up the conversation a bit more um, and uh, looking forward to the discussion in a little bit. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Oliver. That was, oh, oh so I'm muted. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you so much. That was great. Um, really appreciate you guiding us along both the structural government side as well as where these people are coming from um, and how to do maybe some more recruitment. Um, great. So hopefully we're going to switch over to SAFE now, who's going to give us some information about what this all looks like in Jordan. Um, and maybe in response to some of the things we've talked about so far, maybe he'll tell us a little bit about the Higher Council on Disability, which is doing some really interesting stuff with interpreting certification, um, which will maybe fill in some of the gaps that we've heard so far. So safe, I'll turn it over to you to uh, share with us your experience in Jordan. Thanks. First of all, uh, hi guys, I want to say thank you uh, very much for inviting me and I want to say thank you for Dr. Hussain, thank you for Oliver, thank you for you Kate, and thank you for everyone watching uh, now. Uh, first, as Dr. Hussain said, there's a lot of problems uh, facing the deaf uh, community and uh, the interpreter, uh, there's two sides of uh, problems here. Um, but um, there's a lot of solutions in my in my country, like in Jordan, we have and we work together to face this. First, we need to uh, build a cooperation between the deaf person and the interpreter. We don't want to make it like a job. Like uh, for me, it's like, I just want to say that uh, the deaf person is like my friend. He is my uh, brother. Uh, he's one of my family. I want him to feel like I'm not working with you. I'm not uh, helping you because you can't hear anything. I, I really want to be with you just to make feel to make you feel like you are equal to to other people, and uh, that will make a, a big difference. So uh, now I'm opening a door to, to to communicate and to see what is his problem to, to solve it for him. Um, talking about the government, uh, a lot of uh, governments decides like um, the government companies, the government, um, you know, any side of government in Jordan, uh, they don't really know what the, the deaf needs, like what the person want me to do for him. Um, and that that is our job. That's how can we say, uh, okay, uh, there's a list how you, you can make it better for them. How, uh, you should uh, like, uh, let's talk about the banks as example. Uh, the bank, it's, it's very difficult. Um, um, uh, you know, when you go to the bank, you want to have some money and it's just like complicated the steps you want to, uh, to do. Um, the deaf person cannot understand what he should to do. He need a translator. So he won't call one to just please help me. Uh, if I am busy or not. I can't help you because I'm busy right now. Uh, this is not going to work. So the bank here has first job and his responsibility to uh, give or, or to hire uh, an interpreter and um, make him uh, here in the bank for like seven or eight hours a day. Like the employee, employing uh, a, a, a interpreter. Uh, this one of the, the solutions and this one of uh, how can we make it better for them? So uh, what I want to say, and the point is what the deaf people want, what they really want, that's we should discuss with uh, the deaf persons first. Um, and now uh, let's talk about our us, like the interpreter, about our experience in Jordan. First, 18% of my family, as I say, uh, are deaf. So when I grow up, I grow up watching them uh, talking to each other, using hands and signing to each other. So uh, that was very, very uh, important to develop my skills as interpreter. So how can we make uh, uh, the, the person who can don't know anything about the interpreting want to be a sign language interpreter? Okay, first we want to make or we want to give him a motivation. Uh, this motivation is very important to him that uh, you will help a person who can't hear anything uh, reaching his voice. You will be his um, uh, tone, you will be his voice, you will be his ear, and you are the responsible now. So that will make him like, oh, really, I want to help. I really want to help. Uh, there's a lot of kind people who really want to help. So they're learning that uh, sign language just to help that deaf person. So give him the motivation and give him a goal that if you learn this language, you will be and you will have, you will see, like, that's going to work. This is for me. 
and um, um, it's really a very important thing to um, encourage the people from uh, in the school, like uh, like they're studying Arabic, English, math, uh, science, like these uh, subjects. We should put a subject that it's called the sign language interpreting, just like the basics, the main words that everyone in the school should learn. This is a very important step. Um, it's not uh, in Jordan for the moment. It's not. I didn't. I don't think it's started with any country. I didn't hear about it uh, before, like uh, teaching or uh, studying uh, a sign language as a subject in the schools for uh, the first grades. And um, but it's a very important idea. You know, it's not just only about the language, like the sign language. It's all about the culture, the deaf culture. How can I communicate with them? How can I handle this? How can I um, uh, helping them? You know, uh, this is very important uh, to uh, talk about to the children. Um, and um, uh, there's a lot, a lot of uh, problems that facing uh, deaf persons. So that we are, uh, that's why we are making some, um, you know, meetings with them, like asking them what you want, what is your problem. And, you know, there's a similar problem to everyone. So this similar problem is what we want because it's facing every deaf person in Jordan and in other countries as well. Um, so when we are a state, or when we are um, have a good vision for their problems, then we uh, can solve it for them. We, then we can work on it to make it better for them. And uh, let me say about a very important point. I think it's like it's focused in Jordan. There's a three or two for now, and it's going to be three companies that uh, specialize to uh, um, translating and interpreting for deaf. It's called um, the um, vision call or the video call companies. How? Uh, as example, we cannot, as a deaf, there is uh, just like 70,000 or uh, 80,000 uh, deaf persons in Jordan. And as uh, to seeing the number of the interpreter, there's like two or 300 uh, interpreter in Jordan. So this is not gonna be enough. This is just like less than the deaf. So what are we gonna do? The idea it came up uh, when uh, like a few years ago, it's before the coronavirus, it's just uh, um, uh, building a companies that specializing to uh, interpreting to the deaf. How? Exam I'm gonna give you an example. Imagine that I am a deaf going to the hospital and I have a headache and I can't explain what is happening to me to the doctor. The doctor cannot understand what I'm saying because I'm using my hands signing. So the doctor here will have his phone application that is connecting to the company. The application is uh, when you open it, you call an interpreter in the office, in his office. So the interpreter uh, answer your call and he interpreting between you and the, uh, the doctor and the deaf person. So he is uh, just like in the office, in the company and is just using the application, it's so easy, opening it and start to say what the deaf person mean by his signs. And the interpreter will start translating to the doctor. The doctor will understand what the person wants and he will give him the cure or, or the drug, the suitable drug. And uh, this is a very important step. I mean, like there's a solution we will work out and we will work about. So um, um, I think that's it for the helping uh, deaf persons. And it's very important. It's very important to encourage these uh, projects like these companies and start working with them and start making some uh, lessons to uh, the schools, the college, the universities to learn more about deaf uh, culture and more about uh, the sign language as well. So that's it's my experience in Jordan. If you have any question, specific question, please uh, don't be shy to, uh, to ask. Thank you so much, Saif. Um, I think uh, before we get to our audience member questions and comments, hopefully there are many, um, I think we'll turn it back over to our panelists in the same order. So Dr. Hussein, if you want to come on and respond to anything that's been said so far. Yes, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, Saif from Jordan and uh, Olivia 
wonderful uh, sharing your experience and knowledge uh, how to establish the interpreting service uh, program. That's wonderful. Uh, my question goes straight to uh, Olivia. First of all, you, uh, you said that the, that the Lebanese government is the main source of responsibility to provide support for interpreting services. Um, as well as that you encourage the Lebanese government to have the ratification of United Nations CRPT. Right. Uh, perhaps uh, Oliver and other people are not aware about the situation of Lebanon, how the government uh, function taking care of the welfare, especially for people with disabilities. Not only for people with disabilities, but also in general, Lebanese public to poverty people and you know all, all other problems. Lebanon uh, have incur, encountered economical problems. So um, I'm not so sure if the Lebanese government's really keen interest on supporting people with disability, especially for deaf people, especially that the Lebanese Federation of the Deaf, together with the Wasli World Association for Sign Language Interpreter, as well as World Federation of the Deaf, lobbying for Lebanese government to provide support for interpreting services. Um, it seemed to be rather typical. And I understand that when you say that we have a long breath that you may achieve, but for Lebanese government is rather impossible, really impossible. We have tried it with basic, it doesn't cost at all for the Lebanese government to implement the minimum right of deaf people. But so far they haven't uh, fulfilled this. There is a law in Lebanon, uh, 220 over 2000, which said that the services should be provided. But unfortunately, the law is just put on the shelf and uh, not much interest on the welfare, on the uh, taking care of people with disability, including deaf people. So uh, we have also lobbying uh, together with the Lebanese president himself to have the Lebanese government ratify the United Nations CRPT because the Lebanese uh, president and daughter is a member of the sort of advocacy team that working on the United Nations CRPT, but so far there's not so much involved interest in this deal. So uh, we thought uh, that we started on our own uh, together with the Learning Center for the Deaf and the Lebanese Federation of the Deaf. We work together on maintaining, sustaining, to establish our goal to have providing interpreting services program. We will see how things develop, but we started with first stepping stone and then we go on. Of course, we always need support more on the technical part rather than financial. Financial is important, but technical, that we need to have an experience for those who have had already experience in establishing uh, uh, interpreting service program. That would be wonderful. And uh, that is what we need at the moment. And we hope uh, that the Wasli will continue supporting us together with the World Federation of the Deaf. This is uh, just for your information, Oliver. Regarding uh, SAIF, uh, I'm very curious. Uh, you haven't mentioned anything related to certification. And you mentioned about the services and interpreting. This is wonderful. A number of uh, deaf people are involved in interpreting. It's great. But I'm very much interested in how do you provide training leading to certification. Thank you. Okay, so may maybe I can react uh, to these um, additional comments. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Hussein, for enlightening us, uh, enlightening me for sure, on the, the situation in, in, in Lebanon, which I understand is not an easy one. 
And I, I would say that all of your work is definitely you're going you're going the right way. There, there's no. I, I didn't mean to suggest that if the, if gov if government doesn't uh, cooperate, that then uh, you know you just kind of give up. Um, obviously, um, doing what you can on your side with uh, different volunteers, different organizations, whatever resources that you can pull together is of course very very positive. Um, Personally, I, I think even um, soft pressure uh, toward the government, which is, you know, takes however many years. So it can take 10 or 20 years even, and it has done in other countries. Um, but eventually, with enough persistence, um, and this all depends on many things. It all depends on who's in government. It all depends on a lot of other factors which um, are out of our control but as long as every government knows that there is a group there is a group that is 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 saying that there's something fundamentally wrong within their communities um, then hopefully at some point they will ratify the CRPD which then you know makes it go a bit in the right direction step by step but it it, it does take um a, a lot of time as you said and a lot of persistence so thank you for um for giving us some more background on uh yeah how 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 frustrating it might it, it must be to um to fight this fight Great. Saif, would you like to come on and respond to Dr. Hussein's question? Of course, yeah. Uh, Dr. Hussein asked about how can we develop the, uh, the interpreters uh, in Jordan. Is that what the question, Dr. Hussein? Uh, I think it was also specifically about certification, if I remember correctly. Okay, certifications. Okay, uh, there's the, um, uh, Dr. Hussein, can you hear me very well? Okay, can you hear me guys? We can all hear you. Um, I hope Dr. Hussein, oh, there he is. Uh, yes, okay. uh, I can hear you. I'm watching an interpreter that's clear. I turn off my video so I can most interpret. Thank yeah. you, sir. So um, how can you uh, choosing the, 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 inter the interpreter? I'm gonna say there's a, an exam, uh, I'm sorry, there's um, exam like the uh, using on the highest, um, I don't know what it's gonna say, I, I forget the name, but it's like a uh, organization in Jordan that uh, give uh, some um, degrees to, or like a card that you are a sign language interpreter in Jordan after passing a uh, very uh, long exam. Like uh, there's you watching uh, the person talking to you using the hand and you are gonna say what he's saying, translating and uh, someone talk to you and you translating what he's saying to the uh, sign language. And there's a lot of steps to take this uh, certifying. Certif uh, so am um, I answering your question? Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's the HCD, thank you, Kate. Great, do we have any other follow-up questions, comments between our panelists and each other before we open things up to the audience? Not that you're not allowed to talk to each other after we open it up to the audience, but just before we open the floodgates. No? Okay. Um, thank you for this great conversation so far. I think a couple of things that have come up have obviously been this um, great debate, uh, public, private. And um, I think it's nice to see maybe in all contexts that there are different things happening in parallel. So. If the government isn't ready to step up to their role or it's not 
possible. In parallel, we have the work that's happening either on the private level, like we see in Jordan with private companies um, establishing interpreting services, or more at the community level with organizations and DPOs and civil society organizations taking up the reign to teach more people sign language, destigmatize deafness and sign languages, and offer the courses like you do at the Learning Center for the Deaf. So um, yeah, it's great to see these different timelines and it sounds like it's all forward progression. Um, I think I'll turn it over now. We have a couple of questions in the question box and in the chat box. And I encourage, and I see one hand raised, um, but please everyone in our audience um, start firing away those questions. I think our very first question that we got is in the Q&A box. And while I should take the opportunity to practice my Arabic, I will you know, save you all that experience. And I'll ask Itab to read and translate the question that is in Arabic in our Q&A box. If she doesn't mind coming on. Actually, this is not a question. Uh, it's not a question in the Q&A box. It's written uh, uh, So it's, uh, it's about an organization uh, about the deaf in Iraq. It's not a question. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Kate, again. Hi, everybody. Oh, I think we're struggling with you. As my bad, can you hear me? Uh, maybe. Try again. Yeah. So, as uh, Maisa mentioned, this is not a question. It is the name of an organization uh, in Iraq uh, that deals with the deaf community, uh, and hopefully, we will hear a question from them. Great. Uh, yes. So, if you're still with us anonymous attendee. Um, please tell us more about your organization. Um, and I think next we have a hand raised um, by Farah. So Farah, if you'd like to come on screen or unmute and ask your question. Hello, Farah. I'm trying. Uh, I have allow, allowed you to talk, uh, and uh, I'm asking you to unmute, please. Another option, if you have any questions, you can write in the Q&A box or in the chat box if uh, uh, you cannot open the speaker. Yeah, maybe we can check if um, Joel, our other hand raiser, is available to come on and share their question while Farah um, perhaps gets her technical difficulties resolved. All right, so if either of our hand raisers are ready, you can um, unmute or turn on your video and ask your question. But if you're doing that, we cannot see or hear you yet. Okay, maybe while we wait for you, I don't know what kind of difficulties are happening. We do have some questions in the chat box that I will read aloud. Um, so we have a great question from um, Dr. Samir Simreen. Um, they say, and I'm quoting, uh, I'm the president of the Arab Organization of Sign Language Interpreters. 
I would like to thank Dr. Hussein for the information he provided on the situation of deaf and translation in Lebanon. I have a question for him. Have deaf institutions helped to develop and rehabilitate sign language interpreters in Lebanon? And he followed up to repeat this question for Jordan. He says, I am happy with the presence of my colleague Safe, and I am proud of him. And the question is the same. Do deaf organizations work to rehabilitate translators in Jordan? So general question for both of you in Lebanon and Jordan, what is the role of deaf organizations and institutions in interpreter training? And we will go with that answer. Dr. Hussein, do you want to start and answer that? Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Samir of Jordan for his wonderful uh, question. I really appreciate that. Maybe one day we meet each other because Lebanon is not far away from Jordan. Anyway, uh, regarding his question about the institutions uh, for the deaf, whether they are supporting in developing and rehabilitation of uh, sign language uh, interpreters for the deaf. Uh, and the answer is no, unfortunately not. All institutions in Lebanon, there are 14 institutions for the deaf that are working only mainly on educational level. We at the Learning Center for the Deaf, together with the Lebanese Federation of Deaf, are the only, are the only sources and references for providing intermediation of uh, sign language interpreters. Uh, this is uh, a rather a delicate issue, the uh, collaboration between the Lebanese Federation with the institutions for the deaf. The Lebanese Federation of the Deaf thinking to empower the deaf in general terms rather than uh, working on education back then. We wanted to have the deaf people to have a strong identity to face uh, you know, daily challenges. This is one of our programs to empower the deaf. Institution for the deaf working on you know education when the deaf children are there. So rehabilitation and development of uh, sign language interpreters are not there. It's just us alone. So we really hope that we have a collaboration uh, between the institutions of the deaf and us. Uh, but rather we prefer to have a direct, as Saeed said, have a direct contact with deaf adults. We have had experience a lot of experience and knowledge of the sign language in all different aspects of life, domains. It's rather than more effective than having collaboration with institution. Maybe one day we can work together for the purpose of lobbying to the Lebanese government to provide support for, for the program, perhaps. But so far, uh, unfortunately not. Thank you. Uh, Dave, do you want to also respond to the question? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me, guys? Yes, we can. <laughs> Please go Great. ahead. I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Um, first, I want to say thank you so much, Mr. Uh, or Dr. Samir uh, Samarin, for uh, being part of uh, uh, this meeting, and I'm proud of uh, being with you here. Uh, first, uh, yeah, there is. Uh, it's just like there is an exam for uh, obtaining uh, lenses to practice the profession. And after that, um, after that happened, um, there's some uh, once a year or two, twice a year, it's uh, having a tr uh, practical uh, meetings to like making some revisions to the uh, interpreters to um, sh make sure that uh, no one can forget the signs. And uh, he is very uh, confident interpreter uh, and he can um, talking with the sign language very well. And that's happened in Jordan. And we uh, make some um, refreshing lessons to the uh, news, uh, new interpreters to make them uh, stronger with the language. And uh, yeah, that's why uh, Jordan, it's uh, one of the countries that have a very um, uh, strong interpreter in uh, the uh, Middle East. Great, thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh, 
we have 14 minutes left and a few more questions have come in from some brave participants, so thank you. Um, I want to check back in with Farah. I don't know if she's still here, but if you are Farah, please put your question in the question box or the chat. We don't want to miss what you have to say um, because of our technical difficulties. Um, Joelle, I don't know if you're able to come on microphone or video to share your question. Seems like maybe it's not working. So please put your um, question in the chat box or the Q&A because we'd really love to hear from you. Um, but until then, we'll move on to a question in the question box um, that'll open up to our panel. Um, the question many of us probably felt was coming if we've uh, been interpreting or in the deaf community for a while. This question says, why isn't there a universal sign language? Are there efforts to unite these different languages? So um, whoever is feeling motivated, maybe Oliver can talk to us a little bit about why sign language is not universal um, and about what international sign is. Sure. <clears throat> thanks, Kate. Um, and thanks uh, very much for the question. Um, I, I think it's an important one and it's one that, um, that I often uh, am asked and I'm sure it's the same for, for many of you. I noticed uh, in the chat there was another um, question or comment about how to learn uh, English sign language. And so I think we need to um, go back to a kind of the, a, a basic um, fact about sign languages. And um, we should often remind ourselves not to say, let's talk about sign language because there's not only one. We should always think of sign languages uh, at, in the plural. Now, we know for certain that there are over 200 sign languages uh, in the world. Um, and these are languages that have been uh, recorded and basically justified um, by uh, linguists. Now, sign languages do not, um, I guess, follow in the footsteps of their spoken language majority counterparts, right? So, so you have American sign language and you have British sign language. And even though the two spoken languages of, of, of England and the, the USA are the same, we all, speak in English in those countries, the sign languages are actually very different. And that's because sign languages don't piggyback on spoken languages. You can, but that is not the natural way that deaf people and signers have, um, have, e have evolved with their sign languages. So there is no such thing as English sign language. That doesn't exist. You do have um, systems which are basically made up, um, which can take a sign and attach it to a English word order, but there's no deaf person um, who, would, who, who would grow up with that as a natural language. So these are, uh, in, in fact, these are, these are not natural languages. They are, um, yeah, I, mean, I don't know the exact uh, term for it, but it's, 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 it's their, 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 their systems which use aspects of language, but you can't use those systems to express yourself 100% or to understand 100% of any situation, right? Which is why the WFD has a, um, uh, a position paper on the standardization of sign languages. Um, and they clearly state that uh, the respect for national uh, and national sign languages should be should always be prioritized over any other attempt um, to uh, create sign languages that are closer to uh, their spoken language um, counterparts. Obviously, we can't ignore the fact that sign languages don't 
exist on their own. All sign languages exist in an environment where lots of people are talking around them, right? And so in that way, you do have some influence, right? So you would have in Lebanese, uh, Lebanese sign language, you would have some influence from Arabic and from French perhaps that, that show up in how you express yourself in Lebanese sign language. But there's a different way of communicating um, comparing uh, a deaf Lebanese person who is speaking with a hearing uh, Lebanese person who doesn't know much sign language but maybe knows a little bit or deaf Lebanese people signing together at the deaf uh, Lebanese, you know, at, at the deaf club. That's going, to, that's going to look very different, right? So, and I... And, uh, I don't want to like start a whole another conversation here, but I do know there has been um, some quite controversial uh, funding put in, put into the standardization of Arabic sign language um, by the Saudi government in years past, um, and I don't know um, the whole story uh, of that. I do know that somebody had done uh, at least a master's degree or a PhD. On the on on that on the, on that process, but for sure the World Federation of the Deaf um, is uh, does not support any standardization of sign languages because languages are natural and they should be allowed to uh, to evolve as they evolve because as people we don't control languages, we use languages. Um, and, and if you know the, ex the spoken language example uh, of where this was attempted and failed is Esperanto. I mean, uh, don't tell that to the Esperanto club, um, which still exists, but it, it, it's not a language that is used throughout Europe or used throughout uh, the world where there are romance languages. It, it, it's basically seen as, uh, uh, as, a failed, uh, as a failed experiment. So... That's kind of my um, perspective, and, and it, it's not only my perspective, it's, it's the perspective of, of, of many uh, people who are linguists and who are, um, who are advocates for deaf communities around the world to be able to use their nat national, natural uh, sign languages. Um, and if you want, I can continue about uh, international sign and how that fits into the picture. But I, I realize um, that we don't have that much time left. No, that was great. Thank you. And I think it also covers, like you said, some other questions that we had received um, from Arij, who asked about some sign language resources that I think you addressed. And then we also got a question from Gada, who's asked about common signs in international signs. So I think all of those were covered in your response, which is very efficient and appreciated. Um, we have a couple more questions, only six minutes left. Um, one question is quite a simple one, maybe a yes or no from Rula and Dr. Hussein, perhaps you can make your comment and answer this question at the same time. Um, so Rula asked about um, heritage signers if they have to take exams as well to get an interpreter card. So the interpreter card that SAFE was mentioning. Um, so perhaps SAFE can give us a yes or no on that if heritage signers need to take exams as well. Um, and then yes, Dr. Hussein, we'll turn over to your comment as well. Uh, okay, thank you very much for the good uh, question. Uh, um, I have uh, asked about this uh, same question to a special department for technical education. They say that they don't have an examination or the curriculum that is set for interpreting a uh, program. They are depending on us that we should uh, develop curriculum, we should develop a uh, program, interpreting service program, and we should make uh, exams. You see, this is kind of a digital process. But before that, uh, we need to work first on uh, obtaining license, license to open a technical education program. That is three year program. When we have this, then other uh, people like CODA can present uh, examinations. If they pass, 
under our, you know, the Lebanese Federation of the Supervision, if they are eligible to be the professional sustainable interpreters. So the, we have to work according to, you know, step by step, according to formalities. Um, I would like to add uh, what uh, Oliver said, what he said is very good, very important. Uh, regarding the universal sign language, it is very important for people to understand that, as Oliver said, that sign language has nothing to do with spoken language, which is correct. But we also need to understand that sign language is related to culture, to deaf culture. That is important. Sign language is, is the birth of deaf culture. Sign language is becoming, you know, offspring of deaf culture. That is important. We cannot uh, make it universal sign language because first we have to make a universal culture. If we are successful of making universal culture, one culture, then we can work on universal sign language. This is important. We have to understand that each country has a different dialect. Like in Lebanon, we have a very small country. We have a six, maybe more dialect. So we cannot uh, combine into one language, even into one country. One country, I'm not talking about 200 country, one country, we cannot combine a dialect, one dialect. So it is related to their culture, where they come from, this upbringing, the how they learn and how they live, it's cultural thing. Therefore, in Lebanon, we have six sign language because of the six dialect. That is normal, I think. Um, and regarding the uh, clarity standardization, it is very important to clarify we are not working on standardized Lebanese sign language. We have six different ways of signing in Lebanon. We want to protect them and develop them. At the same time, we want to work on a higher level development of the Lebanese sign language on how by compilation, collecting all sign language that been that people use all of a, one country, that is Lebanon, and have it published. When one day the interpreter, let's say the interpreter come from that particular area, know how to use that sort of language, that dialectual language. And at the same time, the interpreter must know all the dialect of the country. It is important. We are against the word unification or standardization. We are against it. We protect, we preserve the sign language that is used by the deaf and local levels. Just to make it clear. Great. Um, and I'm not sure if have we answered the question as well. Safe, do you want to clarify if heritage signers um, need to get an interpreter card and go through the same certification process? Okay, it's very important to have a card as interpreter just to um, introduce yourself as interpreter. It's uh, why it's very important because other people, like the normal people, can who cannot uh, or can't understand the uh, the sign language. Um, he wants to know if uh, this guy is speaking very well, like the true language. Uh, is he translating well, or uh, I don't know. I'm just watching him using his hand and uh, moving it. I don't know what that uh, that uh, sign mean. So um, having a card uh, from the government or from the uh, experience uh, side that uh, specialized of uh, testing the interpreters in uh, the country, um, uh, having this card make sure and make the other side confidence that I have an expert and he will do his job perfectly. And about the exam, it's I I, I really um, it's just like I did answered about it and talked about it. It's exams uh, that uh, contain a lot of stages to uh, make sure that you can speak uh, or uh, use sign language very well as interpreter, um, like uh, translating videos, translating movies, translating an action um translating um from a deaf person to a normal person to a normal person to a deaf person so that's how you're gonna take the card and it's not easy at all there's a lot of people fail in this exam and it's happening in jordan every year to have this card thank you uh that's very clear and i 
hate to rush us off, but I'm conscious of the time. Um, and I think it's a great note to end on about this uh, standards keeping and how, um, as Dr. Hussein said, the, the respect for preserving and using these, um, these languages. And I, yes, I appreciate all of you sharing your experiences. I'm very conscious of the time and I would love to invite everyone to have a final, um, something final to say, but out of respect for our interpreters and respect for everyone's time, I won't do that. Um, I will just turn it over to Itab to close us out, but thank you so much for your time and your expertise and knowledge, all of our panelists and attendees and interpreters, of course. Um, Itab, do you wanna take us out? Okay, uh, can you hear me clearly now? Yes. Thank you, Kate, uh, everybody. It's, it's really an interesting uh, session today. And as we uh, um, the, the end of our session, I would like to thank the panelists for the rich information they gave us. I would also like to thank Kate for the session. And thanks for the sign language interpreters who made this uh, webinar accessible for the deaf community and uh, Arabic. Uh, finally, I would like to inform, as Dr. Hussein was saying, about the importance of making things accessible uh, for everybody. So, um, I have produced a guideline for inclusive audiovisual media and share it. It is so hopefully one, probably around. So we'll set a date, I think these guidelines will be. Um, um, so if you want to contact us, there is maybe a mail that can just uh, have an email. Uh, or, uh, Itab, we are, ironically, as you're talking about making audio accessible, we cannot hear you at all um, because the internet is being against us. Can you hear me now? It's very unclear. Can you hear me now? Not really. If you wouldn't mind typing. OK, uh, maybe I'll be closer. If you could type into the chat box about the um, audio guidelines you were talking about so that everyone can read it, or we can send it as an email to everyone who attended, um, that might be the best way. Yes, thank you, Misa. Just put um, her email in the chat box. Yes. All that being so, said, yes, I think we can hear you a bit now. Just so, close. Uh, so, if Misa can share the email so if we will be sending the email they send us the email whenever we release it so. yes thank you so much okay and uh, hope that we will all work towards uh, promoting uh, full inclusion uh, until have a nice evening and I'm just saying all of you. I think we've nearly lost you, but I'm sure we all share your sentiment that everyone should have a very nice evening and thank you for being here. And um, we'll be in touch with you all over email. Thank you.